struggles and trials. But we know a God who answers to the needs of mankind. We know a God who is able, who told us, let not your hearts be troubled, that we must believe in God, because he has gone to prepare a place for us, and he will come again and receive us unto himself. So we're standing here on these grounds presenting Christ. If you can make it, friends, loved ones, neighbors, if you're hearing our voices and you can come, we invite you to come a little nearer. Until then, we're going to be praying and singing and giving thanks and praise to God. We'll share his words and trust that God will bless you. Let's pray together. Father, in the name of Christ, we come to you. We commit ourselves into your hands. Lord, we commit this community of Great House into your hands. We pray that as we stand here, you'd sanctify these grounds. Lord, we pray you'd bless us here. As we stand to proclaim your name, we do admit that we need your help. We do admit, Lord, that you are the strong God. We come in your name, with your power and your authority. And as such, we command the forces that would come against us to be defeated. Every problem, every obstacle that would seek to be a hindrance, we pray that they would settle themselves and come under the control of the power of the Most High God. We ask your blessings on everything that will be said and done. Touch the wonderful people in this area, those who are in their homes, who are listening. I pray that as we sing these songs of Zion, that their hearts will be blessed. I pray that as we share, oh God, the young men, the young ladies, the boys, the girls, the fathers and the mothers will come to understand that Jesus is indeed Lord. We give you thanks and we commit all to your hands in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. and amen. So friends, here it goes. We are going to be engaged in a time of singing. You might be accustomed to us with a lot of music and drums and what have you. Maybe we'll have those on the next time around. We're going to be without them at this point. Like I said, we will be here just for this evening. And at a future date, sometime in the near future, we will come back for an entire week. During that week, we will stand on these grounds and proclaim the fullness of God. But for now, there will be a devotion team who will lead us in singing and praise. Join with us. If you can come there, God will bless you. Hallelujah. Can we give the Lord a high note of praise? Can we give the Lord a high note of praise? Amen. 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 He's worthy to be praised. I am determined to hold on to the end. Jesus is with me on the Michaeli bed. For I know I have salvation and I feel it in my soul. I am determined to hold on to the end. I am, I am determined to hold on to the end. Jesus is with me on the my candy pen. For I know I have salvation and I feel it in my soul. I am determined to hold on to the end. Hold on. Bye. 
everywhere he went, my Lord, he was doing good. Jesus on the midnight, tell him what you want. Jesus on the midnight, tell him what you want. Jesus on the midnight, tell him what you want. For he is on the midnight today. Jesus on, Jesus on the midnight.
Oh. 
name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That was a wonderful period of singing and praising. Hallelujah. Praises be to God our King. What some wonderful messages in songs. Hallelujah. Leave Babylon and come. Amen. Don't mind your friends. They laugh you to scorn. Hallelujah. When Christ was here, they did the very same thing to him. Hallelujah. But praise God, Jesus did what he had to do. He came to earth. He died on the cross and provided the opportunity for all mankind to be saved from their sins. Amen. Amen. The young man who will come to us next lives in the area and he is one of those for whom Christ died. He gave his heart to the Lord and is growing in him. And that's why we're presenting him to share a testimony today on what Christ did in his life and how Christ is making a difference for him. Brother Miller. Amen. Thank you. I will testify this evening about the goodness of God in my life. I could remember two years ago, 14th of March, I was sitting in church and I was convicted years before, but I couldn't just get up and move. The court wasn't there. And the preacher said, change your way of thinking. And it got me. I realized that the devil was playing with my mind. The pastor been preaching for years. But the devil was in my mind. And it was never until that night I realized that the devil was attacking me. I was not a, a bad boy. Would never smoke. Right. Never in the room shops. Never gambling. Right. Never womanizing. But I realized I had a soul to be saved. Amen. Right? And God spoke to me that night, two years ago, the 14th of May, March. And I changed my way of thinking, and I'm here today to testify that you too. I know some of us, the Lord will be, the Satan will be taken away for thinking, and will be telling us, well, we can't make it in there. Then people to church, you try to work for go. But it's not like that. They are loving. And they are kind. All right. And if you could take me from where, where I was sitting in the enemy's camp for how much years? I won't say how much years. And bring me here today. He could do the same for you. Amen. Thank you, to trust the Lord. Amen. 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 Well, that's the message. Yes. It's a message of how Christ takes us from wherever we are and puts us on the highway to rejoicing, knowing that our sins are forgiven. Amen. I'm going to be referring to the scriptures now. I'm going to be looking at the book of Romans. We're going straight to the word since we're not going to be having light other than that which God has provided. So we're going to use the, the benefit of the sun to share with you the goodness of God. Amen. So for the next few moments from Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, it tells us one of the most simple verses in the Bible. In fact, it is so simple that we are apt to not to believe it. It says, For all have sinned, and come short of the glory of God. Now this verse is filled with meaning. And because of that it is probably appropriate that I read it another time. It reads, For all have sinned and have come short of the glory of God. There is a corresponding verse that's helps to add meaning to this. It is in Romans chapter 6 and verse 23. It says, The wages of sin is death. Thank God it didn't stay there. But it went on to say that the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let's bow for prayer and then we will reflect on these verses. 
If you are in your home, friends, you can perhaps take your Bibles out and find that scripture. Wherever you are, you can find that scripture. You can perhaps read it with me. You can look at it. You can think about it. And I believe if you do, God can help you to better understand it. And if you, if you understand it, if you understand it, it can help to bring a change in your life. Amen. Father, we bow before your presence. Thank you for your words. Thank you because of the sweet sound of these words in our ears. As we discuss them now, Lord, we pray that you would help with clarity. Help us to understand. Help us to be able to reason and see that your words are indeed truth. And oh God, if, if they are truth, and if we do understand them, help us to live our lives based on what we're hearing. We pray that the power of your words will penetrate into the hearts of men. That those who are perhaps on the borderlines, they have heard already, they are thinking about it, that you would produce a full conviction in their hearts. Those who are still stubborn and who are still bent on going their own ways, I pray God that you would capture their minds, capture their hearts, turn them around so that from their lives you will get the glory. This we ask in Christ's name. Amen, amen and amen. So friends, we are going to be sharing with you, like we said at the beginning, the hope of salvation. We're declaring a positive word, a message that speaks to what is happening in our society here and now. The word says, all have sinned. Now we ask ourselves the thoughtful question. What does it mean when we say all have sinned? It might be not so good a question to those of you who are mature and who understand, but to the other minds, those who might be a little more cynical, they might ask, does the child who is just born to good parentage, to homes where God is already present. Is a child born into that home a sinner? Has he sinned? Perhaps they might ask the other question. I am a good, noble person. I am doing all that is right, all that I understand to be right and reasonable and meaningful. I'm helping my neighbors. I am kind to those around. Am I a sinner, pastor? Is it that you are saying, after all the good things I have done, I am still a sinner? I might be a professional. Some persons are very skilled. They are skilled in certain things that, from which they can earn a life. And from their skills, they are helping others. And they're asking, am I a sinner? Though I'm so skilled, am I a sinner too? I'm going to allow God, through his words, to answer. I'm going to allow God's words to answer to the questions that are vexing to our hearts and to our spirits. This is what the word says. I'm going to present it just for what it is. It says, all have sinned. I understand all to mean all. The big man, the small one. The mature one, the immature one. The big lady, the young lady. The father, the son. The mother, the child. The Prime Minister, the laborers in the, in the nation, all mankind. That's 
that's what the word says. All. It means I did sin. It means you did sin. All. All have sinned. It is not that, friends, we were made sinners. God didn't make us sinners. When God made us, God made us good. In fact, when God made the first man, Adam, God made Adam perfect. A perfect human being. Perfect in all things. In fact, Adam was not a baby. Adam was made a big man, a mature man. Perfect in terms of the human species. Adam had a knowledge that was more productive than, than the ordinary one. In fact, today, we have to devise computers and other technical mechanisms to help us to remember the names of all the animals. All the animals among the species. But Adam, my friend, had the technical knowledge without the help of, the help of a computer. Adam was able to give a name to all the different species without written records to guide him. Without the help of anything or any man, Adam stood alone and named all of those species. Yet, friends, Adam sinned. So God made us good. But man, through Adam, chose to sin. From the time man sinned, he became less than what he was intended to be. When sin entered, when sin entered the life of man, the realm of human existence, sin interfered and sin interrupted with the plan of God. It was God's intention that man would live eternally on earth. It was God's intention that all mankind would enjoy peace and goodwill now and forever. God never intended that man would die. That is why in those early years, those men lived up to nine, Adam himself lived for 960 years before he faced death. 960 years. Friends, he was not the longest liver. Because there was another man who lived longer than Adam. He lived 969 years. No, that was long. It's especially long when you compare it to what Moses said in the book of Psalm. In the book of Psalms, in Psalm 90, Moses spoke to the, the length of life. So that our years are now limited to three score and ten. And we can go longer just by reason of strength. What's the difference between three score and ten and 969 or living forever? The difference is sin. Sin made the difference. Sin brought death. That's why the word said the wages of sin.
The Zika virus, it's, it's spreading rapidly. And of course, because men are equipped with the technical knowledge that God gives, man is seeking to find problems. And for most of them, for most of them, man will overcome. But the problem of sin for generations yes. remain elusive. Yes. Man cannot deal with his sins. It is to the extent where a certain rich man, he has all the money, he had all the money that he can afford, that he can get. But with all the money, he didn't have peace of mind. Amen. So with all the riches, he pulled a handgun, held it to his head, and blew his brain out. What a foolish man, you may say. If he had all the money, why didn't he just go on cruises? Why didn't he just live it up? Why didn't he just have fun? Well, you see, this is what sin does. What sin really does, firstly, it blinds the eyes. The, the physical eyes. Sin, sin blinds our eyes. What do you mean? I can see. Well, the Bible speaks about certain people who are really alive, but they are still dead. That's why the word says he that liveth in pleasures is dead even while he's alive. So it brings that sight into question. But I am not just talking, friends, about the physical sight. I am not talking only about, about sight as it relates to the eyes. I'm talking about the sight that goes deeper than that. One that springs from the mind, from the heart from inside because there are many people who have eyes but they can't see they see only what they want to see but the words of God stands supreme that it says he that liveth in pleasures is dead even while he is alive sin blinds the eyes of our minds now how else for whatever reason, how else can we we identify with a person who will take a shotgun and go into places where innocent people are and just try to kill as many as they can kill? People who didn't interfere with them. Does that sound like a person who is seeing to the eyes of his mind? Can a man who, who watches a young child and pulls a gun and kills a defenseless child would you say that man is seeing to the eyes of his mind no. would you our society friends is filled with all kind of problems all kind and some of them we have to ask the people who are perpetrating them do they do their minds have eyes can they see from within some people have no sense of remorse. They can do the worst thing and they're not sorry about it. No. Why do you think a man would kill another one? For a little problem? What other reason can we give for some of the evils in our societies? It would sound as though I'm talking in general. But I speak to great house. Yes. I speak to surrounding communities. Yes. I speak to Camden Park. Yes. We are living in societies where some of us are afraid to go outside. Yes. We are afraid of criminal elements. Yes. We are afraid of some of the young men who frequent our neighborhoods. We are afraid. Some nights ago, I stayed in my home, sitting and looking outside, and saw a vehicle speeding across an area. I took note because it is very unusual for vehicles to drive so fast 
in that area. And by the time the vehicle cleared the corner, I heard the shots of gun ringing out. It wasn't too long after. A young man I knew. A young man I taught. A young man I counseled with was gone down. He has gone into eternity. I cannot talk about his state. God didn't give me that right. Told me to judge not. And I will not be judged. I have no reason to condemn him. I'm not condemning him. What I can do is condemn the act. The act. Amen. I'm saying just like I said with that young man. And if the use of dangerous weapons. This community has its own share of fears. There are young men listening to me today. There are people listening to me. You are planning right now how to commit a crime. You know why? You know why? It's because of sin. Sin is the cause of sorrows. Sin is the cause of our problems. Sin is what is responsible for the problems we are experiencing. What did the Bible say? All have sinned. In other words, I am not much better than the other. We were all born with the sin principle. A sin left in our hearts. Sin left in our lives. Not checked. Eventually will destroy us. That's what Paul said. Romans 6.23 The wages. The payment. The reward. The only just reward for sin. Is death. So friends. As long as a person remains in his sins, eventually he is going to die. You may run now. You may escape it this time. But it remains. The wages of sin is death. Sin not only pollutes and corrupts our lives. But it has a penalty. It makes us bad. It makes us think bad. It makes us do evil. And that's what I was talking about. The crimes and so on. Are the direct influence of sin. Sin pollutes. It corrupts. It makes us less than who we ought to be. There are good, decent young people who were meant to have good, decent lives. But sin entered their hearts and their lives are being wrecked. That is why in Her Majesty's prison, there are about 427 men, man alone. <laughs> 427 there about. <laughs> Only males talking about man. All have sinned. In the mental health asylum, there are about 417 inmates. Most of them are men. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not cursing men. If I do, I'll be cursing myself. I'm not cursing men. I'm simply saying that sin pollutes our lives. And sin takes good, ordinary young men who are meant to live dignified, noble lives. Ordinary young men who went to school and had good education and should have become, from all indication, good professionals. Sin has mashed them up. They can't survive. 
alive now without a spliff. They can't speak two words properly. And some expletives are not in there. But I want to declare today, there is a better way for our young men. There is something better for our young men. There is something better for our young ladies. There is a better way. Sin pollutes. Sin robs us of our peace. It takes away our sleep, our sleep at night. Sin is really destructive. It pollutes. And after all the sin, you would think that I can live and sin and sin and sin and sin and sin. And perhaps if I should die, that should be the end. If that were so, I think it would have been relatively easy. Because all you had to do was to get as much sin as possible, enjoy it up to the max, and then die. Stay in the grave and rot and decay. And if it were to end there, that would have been an easy way to go. But that's not how God ordained it. Perhaps it's what you would like to see. I would have liked to see an easier way out. I would have liked to see a way that you could have do a few things and you go on, live to a certain year, a certain amount of years, and when you're fed up and tired, you can say, okay, I'm ready to die. And you just die, and that's it. But that's not how it is. The wages of sin is death. The word says, but the gift of God is eternal life. Now it tells me that beyond death, there has to be something else. And I'm getting to that because here it is, I'm saying, sin is a problem. Sin pollutes. But sin has a penalty. There's a penalty to sin. There's a penalty. We don't just sin and sin and sin and go to sleep and sin is past. There's a penalty. You have to pay for it. You know, sometimes we think that living is just eating and drinking and doing what we have to do. There's more to life than that. There's a penalty for sins. You have to pay for your sins. I have to pay for my sins. The Bible tells me the wages for sin is death. In other words, because of my sins, I have to die. Well, I did so many sins. I committed so many that I should have been dead a long time ago. But I thank God. I thank God. I will eventually die. I know that. And the real truth is I look forward to the time. That's the real truth. If the Bible says this is appointed unto man wants to die, so we will pay the price for our sins. We will die. But I'm sure you know that there are different ways to interpret that. Because the good thing is, that Christ, the Son of God, the express image of God's glory, is the full reflection of who God is. Christ came to earth. My Bible tells me about Christ. He said that he is a good, he was a good man. He did only good things. All of the accounts that we have, we have read, 
we have heard spoken about Christ, they're all positive. So he was a very positive man. He helped those who needed help. A few people came to him who were blind. There was one in particular. He came to Jesus and Jesus asked him, what is it you're really concerned about? Remember, he was blind. And he said to Jesus, Lord, I really want to see. And how do you think Jesus responded? You think Jesus told him, go and bring your pocketbook? Or uh, go and call your lawyer first? You think that's what Jesus said? Before I perhaps look at your case, let me see if you have insurance. No, my friends. Jesus wasn't that concerned about the physical things. So Jesus said, if you really want to see, then see. And Jesus made some medicine. Using dirt and saliva. Made a paste, put it, in his, put it on his eyes. And granted him his sight. There was one lady who had another serious problem. She was sick for many, many years. She went to different doctors and put her condition to the doctors and told the doctors and spent all the money she had. According to science, according to the medical evidence and what we saw, she had an incurable condition because the doctors could not cure her. She went to Jesus. You know, she was very persistent, a strong, persistent woman. She used her effort and her energies and, and pushed through the crowd and went to Jesus and she really believed that Jesus could have helped her. And she stretched through a crowd and touched Jesus' garment. And I tell you, from the time she touched the clothing of Jesus, she was made whole instantly. Telling you who Jesus was. A good man. People who were poor and didn't have, Jesus reached out to them. Orphans, children who are no parents. Jesus championed their cause. It was to the extent where the disciples, when they saw so many parents bringing children to Jesus, they tried to drive them away. Jesus said, no, I'm concerned about them. Bring them to me. And he blessed them. That's who Jesus was. He always had time for the man who really needed help. He never turned away from others. He was a good friend. And you know what he did? When I was to pay the price for my sins, Jesus paid it for me. Amen. Amen. It's like a story I heard. A story I heard. This young man, his mother bought him a little coat that he can raise and perhaps learn to care for this animal and maybe hoping for reproduction and that it would increase and, and so on. One little advice the mother gave him. They lived in an area where trains passed regularly. And the mother warned him and said, son, for you. But if it ever get, get away, if it gets away, and it gets across the train line, don't ever try to cross. Because
because you know what can happen. The young lad assured his mother that he won't disobey her. So, day after day, he took his lamb out. On this particular day, the lamb burst its chain. Wandered across. And at this point, across the train line, When the young man recognized what had happened, he went in search for his lamb. Desperately searching through the forested area, he came to the train line. As he looked, he saw his lamb standing Right in the middle of the chain line. He heard the voice of his mother saying, Son, promise me one thing. That you will not go across that train line. He stood there wondering what to do. Should I disobey my mother? Or should I just... Leave the sheep and hope that it would come home the goat. He chose to wait, but the lamb won't move. Echoing in the distance, he heard the rumble of an approaching train. And true to form, he started to think about what is likely to happen to his lamb. When he looked, approaching, the, cha the train drew nearer and nearer and with terrific speed, it was coming straight for his lamb. He decided to make a decision. He drew near the train line, said he couldn't live and watch his lamb being crushed. And when the train had approached to the point where he felt certain his lamb would be destroyed, he plunged forward and pushed the lamb out of the way. Saved the life of that lamb. Left his mother in grief. Oh, you might be saying, what a stupid young man. Why didn't he just leave the lamb and die and maybe get another one? Well, that's not the point I am sharing. I'm sharing the idea that Christ he left his home in heaven where he was in the Father's presence. The Bible tells us that he took upon him the form of a man, became obedient to the voice of his father, and came to earth. And died for sinners. You need to look at that another way. That the Son of God perfect in all his ways one who did only good came die on a sin cursed cross they stretch his arms out after having spat on him what an insult to the son of God they whipped him we are told not one, not two, not three, not six lashes like they might give in schools, but 39 lashes across his back. Yeah, they gave him a cross to carry.
Harry. He walked through the dry, thirsty lands of Palestine, up Calvary's hill, carrying a cross on which he would be killed. Crown of thorns was splattered as a sign of mockery to the king of kings. He pushed it in his skull, stretched his arms out, and drove nails in his arms. When he cried for thirst, They mocked the Son of God and instead of giving him some water to quench that thirst, they gave him vinegar. Took a spear and with the force that a Roman soldier can muster they pushed that spear through his side yeah. to the extent where blood and water gushed out. Amen. And after he had endured all that, he said, It is finished. It's finished. Gave up the ghost. He died on a cross to pay the penalty for our sins. Sin has a penalty. Amen. Christ paid it for you. Amen. But you have to accept it. You have to accept it. You have to accept it. What do you have to do? Accepted. You have to accept it. Amen. Salvation is given to you. But you have to receive it. Because you see in your heart. There is that and anger. That, that thing against God. You have to put that out. Empty yourself of hatred for God. I don't hate God. Well, maybe yes, you do. Yes, you do. Because if you love God, you're going to want to trust Him. You're going to want to follow Him. The only sure way to show that you love God is to accept him. Amen. Because we sometimes say words are cheap. <laughs> huh? Amen. The only sure way to show love for God is to accept him. Amen. Not to accept him is to walk in line with the devil. The wages of sin is death. And all have sinned. So where are you today? Where are you today? Know this, know this. Know this, friends. Know this great house. Know this young man. Know this young woman. If you continue in sins, you shall die. Amen. But if you turn to God, if you turn to God, if you turn to God, you can have hope. It is the kind of hope that dignifies life. It's the kind of hope that, that says to a person who is destitute and down and out, I can rise. It's a kind of hope that says, I can be a better person. I 
can be all that God says I can be. Amen. And that's what the gospel is about. Amen. That's the reason why we are here. Praise God. We are here saying to you, if you continue the way you are going, trouble is ahead. Hardships, difficulties. You cry for God, but if you, you, you cry for him, you may cry when it's too late. Hear this account. Hear this account. It's an account of a beautiful young lady. She had what all or most other young ladies look for. A nice, handsome young man. He had a nice ride. It was the kind that the top can just, you press a button and it, it goes back. Dark glasses too. A convertible. <laughs> Little bit of links. And they were just flowing. They did that on Sunday and Monday and Tuesday. But when weekends come around, that was the time to live it up. Constantly. Where they went to party, they would often pass a little church. And one day the young man decided that he wanted to stay and listen. She had other plans. She had other plans. And she chose not to stay. She spoke to him and spoke to him and said, let us go, let us go. She wasn't a very good driver. He was the good driver. And he insisted. I wanted to hear what the preacher is saying. You know, from time to time, she would, she would tell him, and when, she, when, when he felt like, like giving his heart to the Lord, she would say, no, you can't leave me. Can't leave me. But this time, the man of God preached. That young man became so convicted that he was there just weeping and crying. He wanted to give his heart to the Lord. But his dear girlfriend was saying, no, don't leave me. But he couldn't take it any longer. With tears rolling down his eyes. He walked forward to meet that young preacher. The beautiful young lady jumped in the vehicle and said, well, get home how you can. And she sped down the road with anger and rage. When she was to make a right turn, she just couldn't think clearly enough. And she plunged straight ahead over into a precipice. The car was written off. And so too was she. She lost her life. She went into a Christless eternity. But the young man who chose to listen to God His life was spared. He was saved. And he lived a good life. What is the point I am making? Right now as I speak to you, there are some of you who are wondering. And you are thinking, should I give my heart to God? 
some are saying, well, I can't because of. I will, but another time. There's always an excuse. Friends, how long have you been making that excuse? Remember what we said today. The wages of sin is yes. death. But God wants to give you life. Amen. Amen. Give you abundant life. Amen. What you have to do? You have to accept it. You have to invite God to come into your heart. You have to invite God to enter your soul. Amen. And whenever God comes, he makes the difference. Amen. He makes the difference. Yes. I've heard many testimonies of people who are going the wrong way, who turn to Jesus. And then after they turn to Jesus, and Jesus touched their life, they say, thank God. I'm glad I made that decision at that time. I have no regrets. Hallelujah. Praise Amen. God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Never any regret in following Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. Never any regret in following Jesus. You can't regret it. Jesus answers to all the problems of our lives. He answers to every problem in our hearts. It doesn't matter what you have done. Christ loves those who are far from him. Amen. Loves those who are far from him. Christ loves us all. Amen. And if we would accept him, he'll make a difference. Since I'm serving Jesus, I have no regret. It goes something like this. Since I'm serving Jesus, I have no regret. Since I'm serving Jesus, I have no regret. Since I'm serving Jesus, I have no regret. Jesus, he never fails me yet. him to forgive you. Come just as you
heaven, you have heard from God. You have heard the message of the gospel. Paul said, I'm not afraid or ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Why? Because it is the power of God unto salvation. To everyone who believes. Do you want to experience the power of God in your life? All it takes is to receive God's word. I'm just wondering if there's any such person here today. Who want to make it public? Who want to make sure that there is no doubt about their state in life? If there's any such person here, he stands right here representing the kingdom of God and we would like to support you in this life changing decision it's the greatest decision anyone will have to make in this life people make decisions every day they make all kinds of decisions but the one decision to give your life to Jesus surpasses them all it is the greatest most important in life we are here today and we are so interested in your spiritual well-being that we are given a decision, uh, an invitation right here, right now. The opportunity is here. The clock is ticking. Your moments are running out. What will it be? Jesus is waiting. Jesus is calling. The wages of sin is death. It's the natural consequences of physical death. But the Bible says it goes beyond that. If you read Revelation chapter 20, you will see the Bible describes a second death, which is eternal separation from God. Man in his present state is separated from God in this life without Christ. It's our natural state without Jesus. You are separated from God. But should you pass into eternity without Christ, you stand to die a second time. The Bible describes. We are about to close this service. We are about to close this service. We just like to give everyone a special opportunity to make it sure for Jesus Christ. You may be in your homes. You might be considering this decision right now. In prayer. We would just like to lead you in that great decision. Hallelujah. Praise God. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Jesus will not kick the door in. Jesus will not impose himself on you. You must make a personal, a conscious, a willful decision to invite Jesus into your life. Once that is done, once that is done, he promised he will come in and will suck with you. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Hallelujah. Jesus is pleading. Jesus is pleading. The lost soul within us yearns, the Bible says. for deliverance and today is your opportunity this moment is your opportunity Jesus is passing indeed he's passing, he's passing he's looking to see any open heart who will say yes to him hallelujah oh blessed Lord Almighty oh blessed Lord Almighty hallelujah 
Jesus. Okay, let us pray. Hallelujah. You might be in your homes at this moment. But the Lord God, he sees our hearts, he knows our intentions. And he can intervene right where you are. If you are willing to give your life to Jesus, would you repeat this prayer? Say, dear Lord, today I come to you, a sinner, I'm lost. I cannot save myself. I've heard your word today, and I decide to accept it, Lord. Today I confess my sins. I renounce this world. I turn my back against everything in my past, and I receive Jesus to be my Lord and Savior. Lord of God, I pray that you will receive me now. I confess you as Lord and Savior of my life. I welcome you as my King and my Lord. Reign in my soul as from this day, and enable me to walk the straight and narrow. I give you thanks now, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you have done that, if you have truly made meant it in your soul, we are always available. Now and again, we'll pass through this community. You can always be feel free to approach any one of us. And if you care to us, we extend an invitation to you to join us in our services at the Lomans Hill New Testament Church of God. Just after this, just opposite the Lomans Hill Government School. A warm invitation extends you to you. We invite you there to come and share with us and we can talk in a more personal way and lead you in the way of righteousness. Praise God. We want to thank you for entertaining us into your homes and paying attention, listening to the word. And we give God thanks for your listening ear. As we are about to close and depart from this place, let us bow for a word of prayer. Hallelujah. Oh, Heavenly Father, we give you thanks today. We praise and honor your holy name. For in you we live and move and have our being. Your word declares, Father God, we are not able to muster even the courage and the strength to live on our own. We live because of you. Help us to be faithful. Help us to be thankful. Help us to be grateful for your love. By surrendering ourselves to you. I pray God even as we depart here now. That your grace. And the presence of your Holy Spirit. Will remain in this community. That you will remain God in this place. Continue to speak to the hearts of those. Who stubbornly refuse. To accept you Lord. Help them to know that it is dangerous to live without Christ. We give you thanks Lord. We commit this service. And the results of it into your hands. Yes, Lord. Continue to overrun this community. Yes. As we bind the powers of darkness that prevails. We uproot the strongholds of wickedness yes. in this community. Yes. We cast them out yes. in the mighty name of Jesus. Yes. We invite the power of God yes. to reign and rule in this community. Yes. Father God, we give this place to you. We stake the flag of God as our territory. In this place, Lord God, we command the rule of God in this place. As we cast out the wickedness and the works of darkness, Lord. We plant the flag of victory for the kingdom of God in this place, Lord. Be glorified, we give you thanks. In Jesus' name, glorify your name. We give you praise, we give you honor and worship. All the glory. Thank you, Lord. Amen. And amen. Bless the Lord. Hallelujah. We want to say thanks to 